Welcome to season five, episode three of Fire Away, Rudder Law's online show focused on the employment law issues that matter to you. My name is Stuart Rudner. I'm an employment lawyer and mediator, founder of Rudner Law, and your host of this episode of Fire Away. Just a reminder that Fire Away streams live online every month. If you miss an episode or want to watch one again, they're always available on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, LinkedIn, and our website. If you like the show, feel free to subscribe on YouTube. I should note um, that we were supposed to have our Attorney General join us today, but unfortunately, Ms. Minister Doug Downey had to reschedule. So we pivoted and we're going to talk about violence in the workplace. So it wasn't that long ago that audiences were shocked during this year's Academy Awards when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock on stage and Everyone knows that employment lawyers see things a little bit differently at the best of times, uh, but we certainly look at, look at situations like that through a very different lens. So today, I am very excited to be joined by my partner at Rudner Law, Brittany Taylor, and the two of us are going to be discussing workplace violence and what employers need to know in order to be prepared to address an incident like the one that we saw at the awards. So Brittany, thank you for being available on very short notice to have this chat with me. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. Exactly. It is always fun. This should be a, a really interesting conversation. I mean, our firm has blogged about this and talked about it in several contexts already, but uh, there are a lot of employment law or HR law lessons to be gleaned from this incident. So just um, backtracking briefly, we've probably all seen the incident at the Oscars either live uh, or on YouTube sometime since then from all the different angles that are available. Um, but just to put uh, put in summary, Chris Rock was the MC, doing what MCs usually do, do, making jokes, poking fun at people. He made a joke about Jada Pinkett Smith's lack of hair, which I think by all accounts didn't go over very well with most people. Um, but she suffers from a medical condition known as alopecia, which is the reason why she had a, essentially a shaved head. Um, so when Chris Rock makes a joke initially, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith's husband, Will Smith, seems to chuckle about it, uh, but then gets very serious and slowly walks up on the stage, very slowly, uh, and deliberately approaches Chris Rock, hits him seemingly with an open palm. Um, this is all in front of a significant live audience. It's in front of millions of people watching from home. And then he just goes and sits back down in the crowd they engage in a bit of a, a back and forth where Will Smith is being aggressive and swearing at Chris Rock. Um, and then the show just continues. And about a half an hour later, Will Smith wins a significant award, gets up on stage. And although it's a little bit awkward for a moment, uh, he eventually gets a standing ovation. So one of the questions I know that I was asking and a lot of people asked is, why was he allowed to stay there? And from what I've heard, apparently he was asked to leave, but refused to do so. And so the show just continued on. So most of us are not conducting board meetings in front of millions of people on, tel on live television, but you know, let's move this context and imagine if you have a meeting taking place in a boardroom in your workplace and the same type of thing happens. And one of your employees gets up and walks around the table and hits one of their colleagues. Uh, I'm going to go on a limb and say that there's probably never a context in which you should simply pick up where the meeting left off and continue as if nothing happened. Uh, but what do you do? And, and Brittany, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to you to say, uh, to get your thoughts on, on what you do at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you're you're absolutely right. I think you've hit one of the, the first points uh, kind of directly on the head right away is that you don't want to just bury your head in the sand. You don't want to pretend that it never happened. And I think, you know, we, we know from uh, having watched this happen at the Oscars that there is always a moment of shock where you're, you're like, did that just happen? Did I really just see that? And that's, that's fine, but you, you have to be able to um, know how to respond. And that's why these types of conversations are so important because somebody who is well-prepared, who understands what their next steps are going to be, is going to be able to recover from that shock and respond in an appropriate manner. 
So one thing, obviously, you need to respond. You need to do something, so which Stuart has already noted. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is, is kind of an initial uh, piece of advice is you don't want to respond emotionally or in the heat of the moment. So a lot of people, their first instinct when they are seeing something like this uh, after the shock wears off is that, oh, he should be fired immediately. Just, you know, absolutely just pull the chute. There's no recovering from this. It's never acceptable uh, to have violence in the workplace. That's not untrue. A workplace violence is extremely serious and should be taken extremely seriously. But there is literally no situation in which firing an employee on the spot is a good idea. And it's the first thing that you should do. Um, I don't think there's a situation where we would ever advise that that's the first step um, in terms of, of taking action. So when we talk about, we've talked a little bit about what not to do, right? Don't ignore it. Don't respond emotionally. But in terms of what you actually should be doing, what the first step should look like, the first thing when you're dealing with an incident of violence uh, in the workplace is safety. You, you want to make sure that everybody is safe and you have triaged the situation appropriately. Um, so in a situation where you've got an employee attacking another employee, the first question is going to be, you know, do you need to call the police? Do you need to call the authorities? Authorities to intervene. Um, are they going to separate on their own or is there a crisis happening right now where you need to call 911? You need to mm -hmm. request assistance immediately. But then you also want to think about is there a need for medical assistance? So not just do I need the, uh, the police? Do I need authorities in here? You know, think also about is there a medical need? Even if it's just one strike, you know, maybe Chris got hit hard enough that he's stunned. Maybe he fell when he got hit and hit his head uh, or fell into somebody else. There's a potential for injury uh, here that you you do want to take into consideration. So, you know, does, does Chris or anyone else need to go to the hospital? Um, if so, do you know, uh, do you have a procedure in place for escorting him to the hospital and making sure that, that you're not just putting him in a cab and sending him off? Um, and of course, if there is any type of injury uh, or medical issue, you also want to be noting kind of in the back of your mind, I might have some reporting obligations. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of keep that in the back of my mind for when the dust settles a little bit more that I might have some reporting obligations either to the Ministry of Labor or uh, to the WSIB depending on the situation. Um, and then in terms of, of where you kind of go from there, once you've, you've really triaged the situation, you, you know, you've made sure that everybody's safe, you've gotten anybody medical assistance who needs it. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do is, is something that definitely didn't happen in this case, which is you're going to want to make sure that Will is removed as soon as possible, right? He should not be allowed, as you said, to just go back to his seat and continue to participate in the meeting. Uh, certainly, if he is scheduled to receive an award, at your meeting, you may want to think about postponing that <laughs> because yeah. this is probably not the appropriate time for something like that. Uh, it sends a really interesting message. Um, so yeah. in when we're talking about removing Will from the workplace, you know, uh, uh, one of the uh, initial reactions that um, I tend to get when I suggest something like this is, wait, but you just said don't fire him. <laughs> and yeah. it's important to understand that this removal is not a disciplinary action. It is not the same as firing somebody. It is a, a temporary interim step that you are taking just to make sure that this person is removed from this kind of really um, emotional environment, this, this kind of how powder keg of an environment. Mm -hmm. You are getting them out of there as quickly as possible. So you're sending them home on a paid administrative leave, non-disciplinary, so that you can then take the next steps in terms of doing the investigation, which we'll also talk about. Um, yeah. so, so that's kind of those, uh, those immediate steps in terms of what you're going to do right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, you hit a bunch of key points, including the fact that it's not a disciplinary action. And that's why, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we'll suspend him. And suspension connotes discipline. So you're not suspending them. As you've said, it's an administrative leave. And I know a lot of employers hate this, but it should be paid. Uh, because at this point, you are, as Brittany mentioned, we're going to talk about investigating, which is the next step. And investigating, I mean, in this case, you know, with Will Smith and Chris Rock, millions of people saw it. It's not like there's a lack of witnesses or really a lack of information as to what happened. Uh, but investigating includes a lot more, including any mitigating factors, uh, but also any m mental health issues. And so I, I want to come back to that in a couple of points. One, you talked about making sure everyone is safe. 
uh, and obviously physically is uh, a really important consideration. You also want to consider whether there are any mental health issues, either for the person who is struck, for the person who walked around the boardroom table and struck one of their colleagues, are they having some sort of a breakdown or mental health issues? Do they need help? Uh, so certainly reminding everyone if you have an EAP of the availability of that, but also looking into whether they need any more support. Uh, and then we're going to talk about you know, whether there are factors that should be taken into account when you're assessing you know, whether discipline's appropriate. You know, and one of the comments that has often been made since the awards is that this was just so completely out of character for Will Smith. Um, right. And that doesn't excuse the behavior by any means, um, but it is something to be taken into, into account when you're assessing appropriate discipline. So that's something you're gonna be looking at as well, as well as you know, how they re respond when you confront them and ask them what happened. You know? And again, in most cases, there won't be a live audience, there won't be video of what happened, especially if someone hangs somebody else in a boardroom meeting, you're probably not gonna be recording that and have a video ready to go. So part of assessing what actually happened uh, is talking to the main parties involved, but also the witnesses to figure all that out. So, the, uh, and I guess I want to come back to one other point that you touched on briefly, which is, you know, we need to make sure people, you have policies and people are trained on those policies because it's probably not going to be the case that anytime something happens, the director of HR will be physically present in the room. So you're going to be relying upon managers or supervisors or other employees, and they all need to know uh, what to do in a situation like this, in a situation where there is, violence, where there is threatened violence. We, even, with, you know, even if we stop at the comment made by Chris Rock, uh, which wasn't the most egregious of comments that most people have heard in the workplace, but it was inappropriate uh, and some level of discipline will be appropriate. But assuming that the situation ended there, let's assume that he made the comment about Jada Pickett Smith. So put in the boardroom context, let's assume that one person makes a comment about another person's spouse. And assuming that there's no violence that follows it, you're still gonna to need to deal with this situation. Uh, so everyone needs to be, be trained on what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, but also how you respond to a situation once you get past the shock, as you, as you put it before, um, what needs to be done. And all, the, all that needs to be done fairly quickly. You can't, you can't just let it sit for too long. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's a really, really good point is that we are, we're taking this conversation from the perspective of what do you do when the incident happens? But uh, uh, the best way that an employer can be prepared for an incident like this is to take all of these steps beforehand in terms of having the policies in place, in terms of training your staff, training your managers, particularly so that they know how to respond in an incident like this, um, you know, making sure that your human resources staff understand uh, what they're supposed to do if they become aware of an incident or there's a complaint, even if it is a harassment harassment complaint as opposed to an incident of workplace violence, having these policies and having a well-trained staff is going to be super, super helpful if something like this ever happens. So hopefully it never will. Mm -hmm. But if something like this ever happens, your staff is going to be much better equipped and you as an employer will be much better equipped in order to, to, to deal with that situation and know kind of where to go from here. And actually, that's a really, really good segue, because once you've kind of finished that triaging process that we were talking about, so you're, you're dealing with the here and now, the situation has just happened, what do I do? You know, I've got to make sure everybody's safe. I've got to remove the, the offender from, from the workplace. Um, you know, I've got to make sure staff are aware of what resources are available for them, and I'm going to let them know that we're going to be looking into this incident so that everybody knows that, yes, this is being handled. We're not just sweeping it under the rug. Mm -hmm. Then what do you do? So now you've got a moment to breathe. Um, and so your next steps really after that should be find your policy, right? Because you, you're going to want to make sure that if you have a policy that you've trained your staff on, that you are <laughs> following your own policy, right? It's not going to be worth the paper it is printed on if nobody's complying with a policy or even knows that the policy exists. 
right? So find your policy and call your lawyer. Um, and I always, I always chuckle when I give this advice because people are, you know, kind of giving me the side eye saying, that seems a bit self-serving, <laughs> but it is, it's actually really, really crucial to get your employment lawyer involved as early as possible in an incident like this, particularly with workplace violence, because it is so serious. But even with something like harassment, even if you don't think it's a really big idea, it is so much more expensive to try to fix a, an investigation that was wasn't done or wasn't done properly, then to bring your lawyer in early so that they can make sure that all the proper steps are being taken and give you that advice um, in terms of even just administrative things that, that maybe you're not thinking of top of mind, like who's going to do the investigation, right? Your lawyer can be really helpful in terms of, of assessing that need and figuring out kind of where you go from there. And yeah, then of course, just, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Stuart. I was just, just on that point, or two points, actually. One is it doesn't always have to be a lawyer that does the investigation. So when we say call your lawyer, that doesn't mean call them to, to do the investigation. You know, we, 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 in our firm, we tend not to do many investigations ourselves, but we quarterback a lot of them. And sometimes it's guiding our clients through an investigation that's done internally. Sometimes it's retaining an outside investigator who may or may not be a lawyer. Um, but like Brittany said, we can you know, work with you to determine who the appropriate person is. Um, the other point about calling your lawyer sooner rather than later, a, a lot of people that I talk to seem to think you can just get a redo. Uh, so they'll send me their investigation report. And when I start to point out all the flaws, they'll say, oh, all right, so why don't we just retain an investigator and do it again? Um, so you can, and, and you may have to do it again. First of all, it's going to add to your cost. But second of all, it doesn't mean you just get to ignore the first report. And if this matter goes to litigation, that report is a relevant document which must be produced. So now you're in a much weaker position because you're going to be producing this other report, which obviously is not as good as the final one, or you wouldn't have had to do another one. And you're going to be cross-examined based on that. And it's going to weaken your position as a company. So you can't just fix the mistakes you made later on. Uh, it's always wise to get us involved. And sometimes we're just involved on the periphery uh, and we can just give you some guidance as to what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done or what shouldn't be done. Like Brittany said before, but don't just fire the person right away. <laughs> don't send them home on a suspension or anything like that. Uh, but we can make sure you do things properly from the beginning. Otherwise, like you said, it's a lot more expensive to fix the problems later than to prevent them. So I, I know it, it does sound self, self-serving to call your lawyer, but it really, it really is a, a prudent move. Anytime there's something like this, and it doesn't have to be one person hitting somebody else. It could be something less serious than that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, just jumping off from that of, of, you know, what we can do and how we can help. Uh, one of the really important things that a lot of the times you're just not thinking of, it's not top of mind when you're dealing with a situation like this, is evidence, is documentation. Um, and, and a lawyer is always thinking of that. They're always thinking of the worst case scenario. Uh, that's how we live our lives. So, they're, so they are better equipped to help you to make sure that you've documented everything properly. Um, and that's going to include things like, yes, you've already sent Will home and you've already told Chris, you know, you take the day off, we'll be in touch. But you want to you want to formalize that. You want to put a letter together that explains to Will what's happening, that he is on an administration administrative leave while the investigation is conducted, that he is going to be paid, that this is not a disciplinary action, um, you know, that he is going to have an opportunity to participate in the investigation. These are all things that you want to have documented, and it's not just a, a verbal conversation that might not be remembered the same way uh, mm -hmm. by two separate parties, or might not be remembered at all, depending on when you're finally getting to the, the hearing stage or uh, or in front of a judge at trial. Um, so that's definitely something that, that I think uh, aligns well with what Stuart is saying, is just the documentation piece of it, you may not be thinking of it that way, but but lawyers, this is what we're trained to think about, is, is these kinds of things. Um, along with sending letters to, to Will and to Chris, just letting them know that this investigation is being conducted, you also probably want to start to think about any preliminary documentation that you can collect, not as part of the investigation. Uh, it'll be helpful for the investigation, but literally just as a preliminary, what do I have that I can collect right now? Uh, and maybe that is a written statement from both Chris and Will. Um, maybe it's written statements from witnesses. Um, maybe somebody got it on their cell phone camera 
And so you're going to ask for that, right? So collecting that documentation kind of at a preliminary stage, you know, the sooner the better uh, to make sure that you've got that documentation, um, even before you're jumping into, you know, the formal investigation stage of this. Yeah, I think that's really important. And uh, as usual, I'll say, I'll say what I say to everybody, everybody each month, which is the time is flying by because we're already at uh, so, you know, about 20 minutes in. So in terms of the two parties, you know, what, what's the messaging to them? We've talked about administrative leave, but what do you tell the, the two people involved as you start this process? Yeah, no, and, and that's, I think, a really, really important question is, is what is that exactly are you communicating to them? Um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, whenever you've got an incident of, of harassment, there are specific requirements in terms of alerting the parties in writing uh, that you are conducting the investigation, letting them know of any interim steps, which would be the administrative leave in this case, um, that are going to be taken. Uh, you know, if you already know who the investigator is, you might alert them. This is the person who's going to be doing the investigation. They're going to be reaching out to them. Um, you might want them to be aware of uh, the fact that they have an obligation, particularly Will, even though he's at home, that he has an obligation to participate and be available and cooperate with the investigation. Um, and then, of course, confidentiality. You really want to be reminding everybody at this stage that mm -hmm. confidentiality is key. And the, and the expectation is that they are not going to be communicating about this incident to anyone other than the investigator. And they're not going to be reaching out and trying to, to communicate with any of the witnesses or anything like that. You're going to try to maintain confidentiality to the greatest extent possible. Yeah, I think that's that's key. And, and this isn't one of these situations where someone's complaining about an incident, you know, that no one else knows about. This was fairly public, but we do get that more often than not when someone's complaining that they were harassed or sexually harassed or bullied. Uh, but then they'll say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want this to be public or I need your promise to be confidential. And you got to make sure that you, you don't over promise. You cannot promise absolute confidentiality, but you, confidentiality, but you can promise to keep it uh, or only disclose information as needed and no more than that. Um, but the flip side, as Brittany just said, is anybody involved, parties, witnesses, etc., must confirm that they will keep it confidential, must confirm they won't discuss it with anybody else or there can be disciplinary actions. I think it's really important that you stress that from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, so once, once you kind of get all that messaging out, uh, and then I'll kind of jump in with, with the next step, which, which we've talked about a bunch of times already, which is you need to investigate. Right. Uh, and it's funny because uh, regular viewers will know that I created a course for Osgood Professional Development. It's called HR Law for HR Professionals many, many years ago. Uh, and at the time we barely even uttered the word investigation. And now it is a one full day out of five days of the course. So it's, we all know how important investigations have become in the world of HR. Um, but this is the type of situation where, you know, some people would say, we all saw him hit. You know, we all saw Will Smith hit Chris Rock. So I'm just gonna fire him. We know what happened. We don't need to investigate. It's still important. And we've talked about a bit about this already to understand any mitigating factors and also to confront the individual. And when I do the updates to my book and I'm assessing all of the just cause cases, one of the most important factors in assessing whether the employment relationship has been irreparably harmed or whether it can be resuscitated is how the person responds. If the person is apologetic, if they are contrite, if they give you reasonable assurances, it's not gonna happen again. That's all important. And those are all important factors to take into account when assessing the appropriate level of discipline. Whereas if they are belligerent and confrontational and refuse to accept any responsibility for their actions, then you're gonna have a much stronger case for cause. Uh, but you need to go through the process and investigate. And part of that has to include confronting the, the accused. And in this case, we're actually talking about two. We're talking about Chris Rock who made an inappropriate comment and should be investigated and likely disciplined. And we're talking about Will Smith, who engaged in workplace violence and should be investigated and probably disciplined. So we need, you know, we need to investigate both of those. And one might be a mitigating factor for the other. Um, so they, they do have a connection, but they are two different investigations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that it, it, 
succinctly gets to, to, to what you need to know in terms of investigations is that, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's a fact finding investigation, right? So you're trying to figure out what happened, which is where a lot of people would look at the situation and say, well, we don't need to do that. We, we can see exactly what happened. Everyone saw exactly what happened. Um, but it might not be as cut and dry as that. I mean, in this case, we've got video evidence, you know, we can all see it. But in the example that we're using, if you're just in a boardroom meeting, um, you know, even the witnesses, who are there could recall it a little bit differently. Like maybe the the tone that Chris was using came across as incredibly offensive to one witness, uh, but another witness is sitting there going, he was clearly just joking. He was clearly mm -hmm. teasing. So it, it is really important not to make assumptions, not to just say, well, we don't need to do this. You do need to do the, the fact-based investigation, the fact-finding, determine what happened. And then kind of part two of that is, well, now that we've decided what happened, what do we do with that? And that's where collecting that information about, as Stuart said, those kind of mitigating factors or extenuating circumstances uh, that you want to take into account when you are assessing, well, what is the appropriate disciplinary response in this case? Yeah, and that's, that's the key point there, as you said, that the purpose of the investigation is to determine what happened. Uh, and then once you know that, that's when we would be advising our client as to what to do with that information. Is discipline appropriate? What level of discipline? And also, what other steps do you need to be taking? You know, if you have two employees who got to the point where there was violence, you know, can that relationship be, be fixed? You know, do they need some sort of workplace mediation or remediation, just some sort of counseling? What's going to be done to make sure that the working group is able to continue working together without future incidents of inappropriate comments or violence? Uh, but that's what we do once we have the investigation, once we have the conclusion as to what happened. Some investigators will offer their recommendations as well, and it depends on the context as to, what, as to whether that's helpful or appropriate, but the point is that once your employment lawyer has that report, once they know what happened according to an independent investigator, that's when they or we would be offering advice as to what you do next in terms of potential discipline or other, or other actions to, to deal with the matter going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one of the key things that you mentioned there, Stuart, is that it's not always a disciplinary action. There are other actions that you might want to consider taking, like providing training to not just the people involved, but maybe your entire workplace. Like, is, is there something happening in your workplace that has created an environment where this type of conduct has occurred? Is there something more systemic that you need to look at? Do you need to adjust your policies? Do you need to provide refresher training? Um, you know, what steps do you need to take to make sure that this doesn't happen again? It's not just dealing with this incident, but making sure that the workplace is safe going forward. Yeah, and, and that everyone feels safe. I mean, if you're dealing with a boardroom full of people who just witnessed an assault, uh, they're probably going to be in shock and wondering, you know, whether, you know, what the company is going to do about it. Uh, right. You've got to be careful about privacy issues because you can't necessarily say, oh, we fired Will Smith. Uh, or we impose some sort of discipline because there are privacy issues. Uh, but you're going, going to want to have some very clear discussions about what, you know, what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what potential consequences might be. Uh, so some sort of training is probably going to be required in this type of situation, uh, separate and apart from the, the two main parties to the, uh, to the incident. So before we uh, before we take our chance to uh, to fire away and or give our top tips, uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think I think we've uh, we've covered it. All right. So now, uh, as as we do every month, we get our chance to fire away. So what Brittany and I are going to do for our opportunity to fire away is uh, offer our top tips, uh, top eleven tips on responding to workplace violence. So. I'll take the first one. And the first one is very simple. Deal with the situation. Don't just ignore it. Don't just pretend nothing happened. You, have, you actually have to deal with the situation. Absolutely. A very important point. And number two kind of follows from that. Don't jump to conclusions or act emotionally. So you've got to do something, but make sure you do the right thing. Don't just act out impulsively based on how you're feeling in the moment. Take some time, put those interim measures in place and do it properly. That's a, a good segue to number three, which is remember that safety and uh, safety of your workplace and your workforce is paramount. So assess immediately any, any 
risks that need to be dealt with, how to deal with the parties involved, take the interim steps right away, and then you can move on to consider longer term actions. Absolutely. And number four should be no surprise to anybody, contact your employment lawyer. As we've, we've already kind of stressed a few times in today's episode, it is really, really to your ultimate benefit to get your lawyer involved sooner rather than later and make sure that this entire process is, is handled correctly. Number five, conduct an investigation. And as I said in, our, in my course last week at Osgood, we still see a number of cases every year where employers are exposed to additional liability because they fail to investigate. Maybe it's whether it's failing to investigate misconduct, harassment, violence, whatever the case may be, it usually ends up costing them a lot more in the long run. So make sure to conduct an investigation, especially where there is a situation of either actual or even suspected workplace violence. And number six uh, kind of ties into that, determine who will investigate. Uh, don't always assume that your human resources department is the best person or the best group of people to conduct the investigation. Uh, consider whether an internal investigation or an external third party investigator is more appropriate depending on the specific circumstances of the incident that you're dealing with. And tip number seven, remember that part of the investigation must include discussing the incident or the allegations with the accused. So getting their side of the story, finding out if there are any mitigating factors, uh, and anything else you need to know before you make decisions about potential discipline. And although we sometimes, sometimes get pushback on this, uh, first of all, if the person is belligerent or dishonest, you may have even more of a basis for significant discipline or termination. Uh, if they're going to mention mitigating factors, better to find out before you impose discipline than later on when you're served with the same claim. Absolutely. Number eight, you have to reach a conclusion about what occurred. Now, nobody is expecting uh, an employer uh, to, to be looking at uh, this in this, the context of a criminal investigation. This isn't, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt what occurred. This is just what on the balance of probabilities based on the evidence that you have collected is more likely to have occurred. And you do have to reach a conclusion. Um, you, you can't just say in your investigation report, well, we're not really sure what happened. <laughs> it, it, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> yeah, that's not an appropriate conclusion to your investigation. You do have to reach some conclusion as about what what have occurred, what has occurred. Yeah, and, and even where you know when there is no video, um, it's it's just a credibility issue. You as an investigator still have a duty to reach a conclusion. And then point number nine or tip number nine: once you have that conclusion, take action. Consider discipline, but also consider non-disciplinary actions, such as training or anything that is appropriate in order to prevent further workplace violence and to ensure that uh, the people in the workplace are safe, because you do have a duty as an employer to take all reasonable steps to ensure that your workers are safe when they're in the workplace. Uh, tip number 10 is related. Consider workplace mediation or remediation to repair the working relationships. Um, so even in a situation where perhaps there was no harassment found or no violence found at the end of the day, um, you still want to consider, is there anything that needs to be done to bring the parties back into a space where they are going to be productive working together? Um, is that a possibility? Do they need some assistance with that? Uh, so consider that. Consider that as a as part of the investigation. And tip number 11, it will not be the first time you've heard an employment lawyer say this, document everything. Uh, document the incident and the reason why you were investigating, document the process of the investigation, document the mandate of the investigator, document the evidence that they considered, document the findings, as Brittany said, make sure there are findings. Uh, and then document your rationale for disciplinary actions, non-disciplinary actions, uh, and what was said to anyone and everyone, including the witnesses that are involved. Document everything because at the end of the day, if you're faced with any kind of a claim, you want very clear evidence as to what you did, how you responded, and, and the fact that you did respond. So no one can complain that you didn't meet your legal obligations and now should have further liability. So document, document, document as, as we always say. Uh, those are our top 11 tips for responding to workplace violence. That is all the time we have for today, season five, episode three. 
thank you to everyone for tuning in. And uh, thank you to Stuart for joining me <laughs> on this program. I think it's the other way around, but <laughs> thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Um, at Rudner Law, we want people to treat their employment relationships as legal relationships and make informed decisions rather than assumptions. I invite you to keep up to date on employment law issues by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, liking our Facebook page, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as our newsletter. And although we are making progress on the COVID front, you want to be keeping up to date on workplace issues relating to the pandemic as they continue to unfold, uh, and particularly post-lockdown issues, by checking out our COVID-19 Resource Center also on our website. As we always say, though, none of that replaces legal advice tailored to your specific circumstances. If you think that you may need an employment lawyer, you probably do, so please feel free to reach out to us. Past episodes can be found on YouTube, on our website, and archived on Facebook and LinkedIn. And if you like our page or subscribe to our channel, you will receive notifications when the episodes are live. Our next episode will be a fun one. Join us on May 17th for Fire Away's You Can't Do That at Work on Television show. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Rob, Jordan, Rebecca, and Mark for helping put the show together. See you guys next time. <laughs>